In the next hour, we get into it. Yes, Monday Madness featuring Rabbit. And um, what a great interview it was. And we had to pre-record the interview because the guys are all over the world. And particularly for someone like Duncan Fora, who is in Las Vegas, if we had to do it live, it would have been 2 a.m. there when we did the interview. So uh, pre-recorded was better. It was better for the guests. And um, very relaxed and very chilled. We get into it on the other side of this. Combine Investments, an impact venture capital company that turns entrepreneurs' dreams into reality. A core focus is to invest in high growth opportunities to maximize returns for shareholders, at the same time also providing a comprehensive service offering to cover all business needs. From small startups to larger companies, Kaban offers the entire spectrum of service offerings required to get business moving. Visit www.kaban.co.za for more information. Kaban Investments, turning entrepreneurs' dreams into reality. You're listening to RTLSA. I want to be on lockdown with Noel Johnson. You are listening to. You listening to. You're listening to. You're listening to Noel Johnson. Noel Johnson. Noel Johnson. And you're listening to Noel Johnson. And you're gonna party it up listening to Noel Johnson. As I was saying, you're listening to my mate, Noel Johnson. RTLSA. You're listening to RTLSA.
It's off the Rock Rabbit album, and it's the album they're going to be touring next year in 2022. I caught up with the guys from Rabbits during the week, and we did a little pre-recorded thing. And it was a lot of fun, a lot of laughs, a lot of reminiscing. And this is how it went down. It's quite insane how technology has come around that we are all in different parts of the world right now and having this meeting. And Ron, you're in the Isle of Wight. Um, Duncan, you're in Las Vegas. Neil, you're in Johannesburg. Myself in Durban. So um, it's really incredible to have rabbits on the show um, from all different corners of, of the world. And thank you so much for making the time to join us on the show today. You're in Vegas, and it's very early there in the morning. Yes, I'm in Vegas. Yes. What's it like living in Vegas? Is it, is it similar to, to like what it's like in the movies? 24 hours of chaos. You get addicted to the lights. I mean, there's a certain point of you, you miss it every time you leave. You leave town, the exciting lights. It's, uh, it's like, um, it is really welcome to the future. You know, it is. But it's still a desert. I mean, it's got its good and bad. And, and it's not as nice as Durban. So, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> you the and all that. But it literally is like a 24-hour establishment. You can literally... Go out 24 hours a day and get up to mischief. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's all changed because of COVID. Um, I mean, interesting thing, five weeks ago, a friend of mine turns up, always happens in Vegas. You don't see people 20 years. Hey, I'm here. You've got to come see. It. So um, a friend of mine turns up, I go to the MGM, and the place is packed, not a single mask. I thought, is there something I missed? I, I haven't heard the latest news. And, they, you know, they opened up five, six weeks ago, just as if nothing had happened. And look what's happened. It's, it's rampant. So, um, so yeah, um, yeah, so, uh, now that mask, that mask shit's the biggest sort of crap, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a comfort blanket. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's what I'm saying. When they opened up five weeks ago, it's like rampant everywhere. It's like crazy now. So, um, yeah, but, um, we, everything will be good by next year when we start July, August, right? July, August, yeah. we kick. Well, we hope so. We can only hope. Ronnie, you're in the Isle of Wight, which, um, as I was saying a little earlier, I didn't even know where that was until today. <laughs> and that's, I believe it's a little island just off, uh, off the UK. That's correct. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Very chilled. Um, the only thing is, as I said, weather's not great, but otherwise, you know, it, it's like a completely chilled little place. Mm. And uh, a lot of yachts. Is it quaint? Yes, very. You know, uh, in, in especially a little town I'm in, Yarmouth, cobbled roads, um, you know, the high street is where everything happens. So you get about five people every hour walking up and down the high street. I mean, it's just <laughs> like, but, uh, you know, it, it, serious history. I mean, like, yeah. when I walk, when I, when, when I, if I go for a walk on that, you, you walk past buildings and places and, and uh, walls and, that were built like in 1700 and 1600 and some of them like a thousand years old. So there's huge history, you know, which is, which is quite amazing actually. And then on the total opposite of the spectrum, Neil, you in the hustle and the bustle of Johannesburg. Ugh, chaos that place. I used to live, I used to live there and I don't miss it. Not at all. It's uh, yeah, it's pretty hectic. It's hectic. It is, you know, it, it's like, you, you know, me being in Durban and you in Johannesburg, it's like our two provinces have like been the wild west lately. <laughs> it's like being absolute chaos in our provinces. Absolutely still- crazy. It's scary. I think that uh, personally, um, I think a lot of people, I think maybe there was... Uh, a bit of skullduggery involved, you know, but um, I think people were hurting with COVID. And um, I think it just caused um, a mass um, looting, you know? Yeah. A little um, bit of hysteria. There's an, there's, yeah, there's an element. I think in Durban, my God, what you guys went through um, was very bad, you know? 
Yeah, I know. It was so, was quite scary a few days a few days later driving through and seeing the aftermath of what was left behind in certain areas. Anyway, let's let's talk a bit about rabbits because I was introduced to you guys as a band, um, not personally, but it, but I was introduced to rabbits music very early in my life, and I mean, you guys were rocking before I was born, but. My father was like one of the biggest fans of Rabbit, and uh, man, he listened to a lot of Rabbit growing up. <laughs> it's really awesome to to have you guys on the show. With that in mind, I was reading somewhere that um, Rabbit started originally in 1972, but you guys were actually only involved in the band from 1975. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what Rabbit '72 was purely and utterly just a session group that did a rework of version one of Rabbit's Locomotive Breath. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's all it was. It was session players. Um, I think, Tre well, Trevor was involved in it and a couple of other guys were involved. And that being, you know, it was a, it was a, a great song and everything. And it, it did a chart on Springbok Radio. And um, when Rabbit and Duncan, myself, Neil and, and Trevor sort of all got together. Patrick van Blerk um, was thinking of a name that mm. would really be advantageous to all of us as a start off group. So he sort of said, take on the name Rabbit. It's already had a hit, but you've got to redo Logomotive Breath. And of course, what we did, we did it properly. And it charted again and stayed on the charts. And th thus, it was actually born in, I think, 74. I actually listened to that version today. And I believe it or not, I'm going to really throw myself out here by saying, I think it's better than the original. <laughs> the original version. I really do like it a lot more. It's the bass and drums there. I mean, everything on it. It's yeah. bass and drums. Neil, can I just say something to Neil? Bass and drums. Those two. Let me let me tell you something, Noel, about Neil. Okay. <laughs> Basically, Neil, where are you? <laughs> Neil, are you there? Okay, because I don't know why I can't see. You. <laughs> I have I, I I have a I have a love hate relationship with Neil. The hate part is like when he arrives late for interviews, but the love part <laughs> is I tell you when when him and I play together. Mm. Uh, I, I get goosebumps when I just think of what we've done together and how, how we've played years and years and years from clubs to to the big stages around South Africa stadiums. And I'll mm. tell you what, I, I just knew we could never fail just with that, just with that, let alone Duncan and Trevor. Oh, you, know. you know, I can vouch for that if I can interrupt. I've very first rehearsal with the four of us. Um, I was at Sat Bell Records and I was coming up the elevator and Trevor wasn't there and there was just this wall of music, noise, we might call it noise, but just wall of, um, of uh, kind of like the police on steroids. It was just, a, and it was just bass and drums. I've never heard anything like that. I've never forgotten that. The two of them were just monstrous. And I think, no, you just, you just, um, you know, when you said locomotive breath, it sort of really sort of shows Ronnie and Neil together, the bass and drums, just monstrous. And, and all the rabbit had that. So, yeah, we don't even need Trevor now. So, cool. <laughs> a lot of people won't understand how important the relationship between the drummer and the bassist is. Um, I, I, I think a, a really good band has got a drum and a bassist that really connects on a different level. Um, would, it be, would it be a fair statement to say something like that? Well, these... These two knew each other since they were three years old or five years old. Yeah. Nobody knew. They um, lived two houses away on, on what was the street? I always remember what was the street. Yeah, no, we were very close. We, we've known each other all our lives. Was it a dream? Was music a dream? Was it just something that you, that you wanted to do from the age of three and you just followed it and pursued it and just went on with it? Um, I think that... Uh, an important thing is that um, we, we grew up, Ronnie's brother was a musician and my brother was a musician. My brother played the saxophone, older brothers. 
So, you know, we were exposed to, uh, Ronnie's brother had a wonderful band, they were called the Fireflies. And they, play, they played at um, the Empire Theatre and the Piccadilly, and kids went to the shows on a Saturday morning and they swapped comics. Um, so it was something we were exposed to and we aspired to, you know? Mm. Um, so I think, and at the time there were the Beatles and the Stones and, and I don't know, we, we just had a natural flair. Ronnie picked up the bass guitar um, and I was five um, and stayed at five. And Trevor's brother fancied my sister, Charmaine. And the one day, yeah, he came with Trevor. He brought Trevor over. And Trevor met me and he said to me, listen, do you want to have a smoke? And we went around the corner and we smoked a cigarette. And we were, and that was it. And You know what, mate? That, that wasn't standard five. That was about standard three. Because <laughs> you, you... You, Trevor, and I, and 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 uh, little Alan, we were we we were doing conglomeration when we were like twelve. Yeah. So you know the thing today, um, it's the Malcolm Gladwell eleven thousand hours. So Ronnie, me, and Trevor played together for thousands of hours. Yeah, we played sessions, weddings. Uh, restaurants, um, you know, uh, it was just, it's so sad today because you can't see people um, because of COVID and everything. I'm saying we mastered our instruments. Yeah. I was seven, I was seven years old and I went to see a band called the Henny Becker band at Brett's, at Brett's. And I was allowed in because of, you know, the laws for the liquor licenses. And I saw this drummer, Tony Moore, and I was completely besotted with him. And I'm just saying, so it was honestly, it, nothing else mattered except our music. Ronnie and I were next door neighbors. All we wanted to do was play. That's it. Absolutely. And play we did. And then one fine day, Van Blurk brings along Duncan. And that just rounded everything, huh? And everything just got rounded. The chemistry, the full chemistry. Nice. You guys were the closest thing, in my opinion, to rock stars that South Africa has ever had. And you guys were a complete package, not only excellent instrumentalists and vocalists and, and writing good songs, but you also had the image, that look, that um, rock star appeal about you. And I read somewhere that your fan base was largely female, which is, <laughs> which is exactly what a rock band needs. Am I accurate in saying that? <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. I mean, the image, that look, is uh, something I, I wish to hell we could have retained. Because uh, <laughs> when I have a look now, <laughs> hey, when, I look at, when I look at us now, uh, I tell you, we shouldn't call the we shouldn't call the tour rock rabbit. We should call it shock rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we leave part one. And when we come back in the next part, we talk to them more about what it was like being so famous and hear some incredible stories about what it did for them. Coming up in part two, just in a little bit. listening to Monday Madness.
It's another track off the Rock Rabbit album, this one. I've been aware and um, like the sound and feel of it, man. Can't wait for the whole album to be released. In part two, we speak to them more about what fame and fortune was like for young members in the music industry and some of the interesting things that they encountered and um, experienced throughout this process. I had Cindy Alter from Clout on my show this week. and. And we were also talking about being young and rock stars to a large degree. I mean, Rabbit was on another level. What was it like being thrust into that fame and fortune? Well, maybe not fortune because music, I don't believe musicians really make money. <laughs> not until they sell 20 million records. But what was it like being thrown into that limelight? It was great. Fabulous. It was unbelievable. We didn't, we didn't know what hit us. I mean, we didn't know what hit us. No, it was, it was, it was too, you, you just couldn't conceive. Do you know it was, uh, Neil, do you, do you, I mean, just, just, just to elaborate a bit, sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, it actually got so big that we actually had to get away from where we lived and we had to go and live on a farm uh, to get away from to get away from the, the exterior. And we actually had to go and live on a farm. It is, it is actually true. I mean, we did get to a point where, um, you know, it was actually crazy. It got too much. Because normally, I mean, you get a lot of fans, the phone doesn't stop, and they end up in your doorstep, and they follow you wherever you go. And it's all fun. And you think, oh, wow, this is great. And you're saying, you know, everything's going. And then it, we actually got to the point where, you know, not compared to the Beatles, but we got to a point where it was too much. I mean, it just got, and when I left South Africa, it was four days after we broke up. It just a political thing was screwing us up. And um, long story short, a couple of months in, my manager was Freddie DeMann, who later became Madonna's manager and Michael Jackson's manager. And I guess I left him to join the base city of Rollers. Anyway, <laughs> Freddie... <laughs> Freddie was my manager, yeah, Madonna got my manager, as did Michael Jackson. Um, I went with Michael, that sounds very really impressive, but it's true. I sat in front of the limo drive and three of the Jacksons and Freddie sat in the back and we went to see the Stones. Jeez, ordinary day, going with the Jacksons to see the Stones at, at uh, yeah. was Anaheim. Yeah. Anaheim yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I always remember walking in with Michael and Jermaine and... Um, and it was, you know, in, in the rabbit days, you, you kind of, it's like you're in the Kruger Park. You know, once you've been there four days, you start seeing all the little movements going around. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of used to, you'd go somewhere and there would be some, they'd charge up you. I'm not sure this one would come with, and you'd have to. Um, and this was the first time in my life I was enjoying it. This I could pick up, there they come, and they'd run right past me, to Michael. <laughs> so that was really funny. And it was, and I remember thinking, I like this. <laughs> They're coming right, right past, and yeah. they end up with, and that was, uh, yeah, that was rabbit. We had all that we're to the point where it was pleasant to get away. And I remember getting to America. It was almost like a pleasure because you, you could go out. Because um, we couldn't go out, you know, unless you had bodyguards. It was Do you remember that moment. one day when we went to record and uh, we got out the car and there were a bunch of little schoolgirls walking on the opposite side and the one kid ran across the road and got run over. Thank God. Thank God she didn't, she didn't get uh, seriously injured. But that was a shock. Ronnie, what about Coliseum? There was Duncan, there was 55 guys, 55 guys with their arms joined together in the front of the stage. <laughs> actually, it's grown by six since we it's actually 49, but for, I'll settle for 55. But yeah, um, we do <laughs> remember Michael. Um, it's true, he, he had all the security guards. He was eventually out in the street to, uh, trying to find guys to hold people back. I remember that in the OEM. Yeah. Then we had security guards holding the security guards back. 
I saw a picture of you online where someone was actually ripping your shirt trying to get to you. It was that that crazy. That was an ordinary day. Everybody had that. I mean, yeah. Neil Neil had to replace his wardrobe every two weeks. Um, <laughs> yeah, but a lot of this stuff, unfortunately, has gone missing. Um, but as we move ahead, we hopefully some people have recorded things as we went because we did so many shows. The making of getting through to you. Um, Lots of things. Here we do a pop shop a hundred times, maybe all the songs we did. Hopefully we can we move ahead, yeah. What were some of your favorite memories from that time with rabbits? Punching Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the Coliseum. I think the early days, Ronnie picking me up in the little blue beer Volkswagen. Um was fun. I mean, and, and obviously the Coliseum. We were at the Coliseum, you remember, guys, 13 times. The first one was uh, 76, right, in 77. We, well, no, we did it that much, huh? We did nine shows the first time. We did six shows and they added an extra three. And then the next, uh, I remember we did. Uh, we were the first to, com to um, launch a compute ticket, which I'm sure you've heard of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we opened Radio 5. We opened Radio 5. Remember Compu Ticket? Percy, what's her name? Percy Tucker. Yeah, we launched it. Percy Tucker, he, he wanted, you know, he said, how are you going to fill the Coliseum? We ended up with 13 shows. Sure. That's it. And then Radio 5 as well. About, I think about 40,000 kids, wasn't it, Ronnie? Oh, yeah, easily, easily. Well, D Duncan, what, what, what was this about Radio 5? I can't quite... I, we were in, I think it was Cape Town because I heard something... Oh, oh, oh we, did, we did that midnight thing on a the show. Yeah, it was really exciting. They opened the radio. Opened yeah, the radio yeah we got a recording of that. Um, it's all that time. A minute. Yeah, and we stopped. They sort of stopped at the 10 to sort of 12 on midnight. And then um, it was really exciting. And everybody was ready and they opened the station. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. But it must have been coming into 77, was it? it was, or 78. I'm not sure. Was Trevor with us or with him? Um, yeah, no, that was about, that was probably more like 76, uh, Duncan. But anyway, it's not important. But it, okay. it, we, it was one of the New Year's we saw in where it was at the Three Arts in Cape Town. <laughs> we, did a, we, we did a show that ended at midnight. Yeah. Yeah. And then we did Film Trust Arena. Remember the Film Trust Arena, that, that stadium with the big tent, massive tent. That was That was another one, the Film, the, the film Trust Arena, right? Yeah. What about John Paul Young? John Paul Young. Yeah, I remember him. <laughs> I nearly got killed at one of his shows. You know, I was sitting uh, in 77 and we were invited. And I was sitting there we because we, we played there so many times. It was like a second home. And I was sitting in the wings behind a huge stack of um, speakers. And this horn was on top, maybe, I don't know, 15 feet up. And, um, you know, those metal horns with the edges and the whole bit, you know. And the, so I got off this little bench. And the stress flip, and it wasn't that word flip. So, um, this, this thing fell on the chair and broke the chair. And I was like, God, if I didn't get up, probably been killed. So I was nearly killed at a John Paul Young show back so. Sure. <laughs> I remember John Paul Young. And another thing, I remember John Paul Young, because that same, the next year with Freddie, Freddie DeMann, I almost got to sing that song. Uh, what was his head? Oh, Come on. Hero. No, no, uh, that was Rollers uh, as well. Um, it'll come to me. I did one of them. What was it? Uh, uh, the John Paul Young, I was almost got to sing. It was a big hit. I'll, I'll, it'll come to me now. It'll remind me. Wasn't that um, I Hate the Music, Duncan? No, another one. Love is in the air. Love is in the air. Now my buddy's got love is in the air. <laughs> I, I know that song. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, John Paul Younger. But that was Freddie, the same guy I said, who, went, who went on to manage Madonna. And I left him to join the Bay City Rollers. Mm. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Because after, after Rabbit ended, um, you guys all went on to do quite a bit significantly with, with your... With yeah, your personal career is going forward. Years. I was just about to say, Peter Frampton. You spent a bit of time with Peter Frampton. Yes, yes. Peter was looking. Peter was looking for a drummer, 
and he interviewed a hundred guys on the east coast and um he also shared eric's drummer eric clapton his name was jamie aldaker jamie unfortunately was very busy um doing an album he was recording an album jamie and he couldn't get away i'm trying to think who he was recording with um anyway i think he was working with eric so i flew up to westchester i was picked up in a limousine and they called peter and we played wah 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 wah, wah, wah. i wonder how you feel it and I played with him. Anyway, I went back to Florida and I got a call to say, listen, we've decided to take the drummer from Imagine, John Lennon. He's an American yeah. drummer. We just a bit worried about your papers being South African. And yeah, so they took this guy. You'll know his name if you see him on the on 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 John Lennon's last album. Anyway, he played the first night. He played the second night and he couldn't cut it. He never had the stamina for Peter. They phoned me, they said, Neil, we're booking you at Criteria Studios where the Bee Gees were working, Olivia Newton-John and Andy Gibb. I was there with Andy Gibb. Um, the Eagles were busy recording at Coconut Grove, Hotel California. That was what was happening. So they put me in the studio and they played me the show, Peter's show. And I played with the show for three days. They picked me up with a helicopter and they flew me into Jacksonville. I played in front of a hundred thousand kids with Peter. I never made one mistake. And then knocked out. And I went on the tour. 48 states in seven weeks. Wow. Well, have you got pictures of that? We must get pictures of you in the crowd. I'd love to have you. We should have that in our portfolio, yeah. I've got goosebumps now to hear about a crowd like that. And I'm, I'm, I must be, I have to tell you a sad story that Jamie Aldaker, who was the other drummer, passed away um, this year. He was 65 years old, Jamie Aldaker. Eric Clapton's drama. Now listen, uh, talking about that, all three of us just better make sure we stay, we keep going for another year. Because <laughs> we're all popping off. <laughs> no, nah, man. You guys look like you've got a lot of energy, a lot of stamina in those legs and arms. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean just for another year? You gotta you guys are gonna be going for another four or five years. Watch. I've got it, I've got it, I got it. Ronnie, you went, you went into production. Um, uh. When Rabbit broke up, um, I just cleaned myself out. I took about six months and uh, I sort of did a bit of rehab and everything because I had a few problems. And um, then, uh, you know, I started training, all that kind of stuff. And uh, then I started an a independent music production company um which i had for many many years after that it was pretty good i did pretty well out of it and but then i started hating i, I don't know what it was but I, I really really started hating the kind of music and everything yeah i really didn't get into this rap thing and mm. no i don't have any you know it's, everybody's got their taste but it just wasn't for me and um i just um at, at that time um uh, after quite a long time, um, I, I just recently got married and um, my wife was pregnant and she was just about to give birth and I started, um, in fact, sorry, just, yeah, uh, a good friend of mine at the time, uh, advertising guy, Reggie Descaris, um, he, he showed me an article in Newsweek um, uh, which, which showed uh, the article was about how um, Mozart's music has a positive effect on babies and children. Okay. And I really took this and I, and I, and I thought, wow, this is, this is interesting. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I 
took up the concept, I put it together an, an album of classically styled music uh, and classically styled nursery rhymes and lullabies. And I called it Majors for Minors and I released it and it, it actually went totally berserk. I mean, worldwide, you cannot believe it, it was on CNN, everything. And um, yeah, then I just kept on releasing more uh, albums from Majors for Minors. And it served me brilliantly for about, uh, I'd say, at least 20 years. That is incredible. What is, what is the science behind the classical music and the impact it has on, on young brains? No, basically, simply, it, it's, there are frequencies, certain frequencies mm. uh, that uh, have been proven to uh, calm the cortex. Uh, yeah. in the brain, you know, like uh, it, it, it's a it calming effect. Um, other styles of helps with focus. I mean, things like whale calls and all that actually have an effect on the brain. Look, the sea, if you lie and you just chill mm. by the sea and you listen to the waves, I mean, basically it's a frequency. So yeah. uh, what I did with the majors for Mars music, we did a lot of research and we just um, infused all those kind of frequencies into the music. And at children worked. Listen, we basically I sold up up to now probably sold a million copies, close to a million. Yeah, that's serious. I mean, you know, that's 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 not bullshitting. That that is genuine. Incredible. And in part three, we find out more about Duncan's experience with Bay City Rollers, and then we talk about the tour that's coming up next year and the reunion, so to say and um, find out more about what the process is going to be getting back into it and things like that after quite a substantial break but we're going to take a little break just to do your power play trivia on the other side of this combine investments and impact venture capital company that turns entrepreneurs dreams into reality a core focus is to invest in high growth opportunities to maximize returns for shareholders at the same time, also providing a comprehensive service offering to cover all business needs. From small startups to larger companies, Kavan offers the entire spectrum of service offerings required to get business moving. Visit www.kavan.co.za for more information. Kavan Investments, turning entrepreneurs' dreams into reality. Own your piece of RTL by sponsoring a feature. Burning Top Badger Friday in other news. Power Play Trivia. You will be helping keep RTL on air and building infrastructure for as little as 300 Rand per week. Have your or your company's name associated with the fastest growing online radio station in the world. world, world, world. The RTL SA Top 10. Your top three. 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 Contact RTL for more info on WhatsApp 064. 134-0020 or email info at noeljohnson.co.za It's time to mass debate on RTLSA. You're listening to RTLSA. Time to test your knowledge with Power Play Trivia. Right, today's Power Play Trivia brought to you by Bev Miller. Which country consumes the most chocolate per capita? And I've got correct answers from Marius, Bob, Zelda, Cheryl, and Lauren. And a pretty easy one today. The correct answer was Switzerland. Hello, everyone. In this video, I'm going to give you a very interesting information about the consumption of chocolate of a country. So... Here's a question that I'm trying to answer. The question is, which country consumes the most chocolate per capita? And this is the answer for the question. The answer is Switzerland. Switzerland was the biggest consumers of chocolate, was the biggest consumer of chocolate per capita. 
with proportion of 8.8 .8 kilogram eaten per person. Wow. You're listening, You're listening to RTLSA. Also of the Rock Rabbit album, hello and welcome home. In part three, we find out about Duncan's experience with the Bay City Rollers, and we talk more about the tour and, and the reunion, so to say. I say that too very loosely, um, because I don't think it's a reunion. I think it's a reignition, something like that. All right, but uh, in this third part, um, there's a few laughs, and we find out more about what is happening next year. And Duncan, you went on to the Bay City Rollers, had quite a successful time with them as well. I had a great time with them, yeah. We traveled the world for three and a half years. Was, I saw virtually everywhere. I mean, we were literally in places you, you wouldn't know where you were. You'd have to pick up a phone book. I remember calling my parents one day, where are you? I don't know. <laughs> There's a phone book. It was Jacksonville. <laughs> You know, we'd always go to Miami, New York, and uh, but you places like Mobile. We never heard. And suddenly you're in a place like Mobile that everybody knows. Yeah. For us being South African, those well, we've never heard of this book. But yeah, it was a lot of lot of. We also did six nights at the Coliseum, so I did a total of nineteen shows there: thirteen rabbits and six of the rollers. Um, what was the comparison like being with a successful band like Rabbits and then going into another successful band like Basically Rollers? Very similar because the audience was very similar, you know, the, hmm. the rollers that also that, um, uh, I love them both. I mean, you know, the years have rolled on. I think, um, I think rabbit breaking up is one of the greatest tragedies in rock and roll. I think the greatest tragedy is bad finger. Um, uh, well, is, is watch a show called they sold a million on, on bad finger. It's a really interesting YouTube. Uh, of course they sold probably a hundred million, but, um, it's a TV show they had in England called They Sold a Million and the Badfinger one. It's really, a, it's kind of like a Shakespearean sort of tragedy because as you probably know, um, two of them hanged themselves. First was Pete Ham. And I was like, early rabbit days, I wrote a song called Pete Ham because I love Pete Ham. It's like another Beatle to me. Remember the guy sings, no matter what you are. And day after day. And he, their money was stolen. He got drunk one night, he hanged himself. And then eight years later, the other guy, the guy sings Come and Get It, because again, they had two, two strong singers. And the other, he hanged himself because they lost all their money. So I thought, uh, not, um, so that is an incredibly tragic story. And I just, in um, 87, 88, I just had the song on Madonna's album. First time in my life, I had a huge paycheck. And uh, the phone got, and it's Joey Mullen from Badfinger. And I just heard that, that Tom Evans, he was the second one who did hanged himself. It's, it's really tragic. You just watch this. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, they asked me to join the band in 88. And I, and I, like a fool, I said, no, you know, it just felt weird because I just had to, and for the first time in life, I had, I had a check, you know, uh, from Madonna. So, so I said, no. And then we fast forward to 2010. Um, Badfinger, you know, reincarnated with Joey Mullen, the sort of, and, and uh, the drummer, Tom, Tom, uh, Mike Gibbons, yeah. So, um, 
So I was going, yeah, now I want to get in the band because they had a guitarist and they went to Australia. They worked for six weeks. They never got paid. So I was kind of pleased I never got on their tour. But yeah, and just to not change the subject, if you have a look at uh, the Bad Fingers story. So that is really tragic. So we're not on that level. But Rabbit breaking up just musically, um, it was phenomenal. I mean, I, I've worked, and I'm sure like all of us, we've worked, being an American, I mean, it's been many years. I've worked, I've kind of worked with everybody, guys from the cult, from you name it, I've worked with them. Uh, and, and I've never found a Ronnie and Neil or Trevor, you know, I found great musicians, one of the best drummers in the world, Billy Joel's drummer, I've been some recording in Canada. And, you know, he's obviously world class. He's on all Billy Joel's hits and that's the caliber of Neil. Um, yeah, I was very blessed, I was very spoiled because they were so good that everybody you meet, oh, there's Donso, the incredible guitarist, and he's not, oh, he's not as good as Trevor. There's the sounds incredible drummer. Oh, I'm looking at him, he's not as good as Neil. Amazing. And same goes for the bank. It is a tragedy that, that we broke up. It was political. We all had different things going on. We were young, sport brats, there's no doubt about it. And um, yeah, if we have another shot with Rabbit, let's make it happy yeah, and grow. Well, that's what this is all about. So 45 years later, <laughs> that's incredible. 45 years later. What was the thinking about getting you guys back together now? And, and looking at this tour next year and things like that? Well, to be simple, I, 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 to be honest with you, let's straight out. I'd get a call from a guy called Cliff Murray. Okay, and it was, <laughs> and, and, Cl and Cliff was just like, let's do it. And he said, listen, I've been talking to Duncan for uh, this and that and that. Would, would, would you be interested in sort of touring South Africa with Duncan and doing a sort of rabbit thing. And at first, I just thought, well, and then after about 60 seconds, I thought to myself, you know what, mate, in a year from now, you're going to be 70, you're doing it. And you're going to, and, 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 and you know what? I just thought to myself, Cliff is the man. He, he, I, I just love the way that the guy was speaking. Uh, I liked his tone. I, I just, he, he, was, he seemed very professional. And um, I just, then I thought to myself as well, like in those very early days in the 70s, I hauled Trevor and Neil out of various places to get this band together. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do it again. Okay. With a help from a little help from my friends, I'm going to do this again. And we're going to pull this thing together and we are going to have a show that is going to blow heads off. That is something I guarantee. You know, a lot of time has passed since the seventies and you guys were very energetic on stage. What do you guys, do you think you can replicate something like that going forward or is it going to be a, a more intimate show? Got, no, no, I, 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 I don't think it's going to be that. I don't think it's going to be, I think, I, I think there's going to be energy beyond. Listen, you know, with all due respect, I know it, it does sound crazy. I mean, late 60s and all the rest, mid 60s. Listen, you know, we know, we all know that next year, as an example, groups like the Rolling Stones are, are, are up there. And I can assure you the Rolling Stones are, probably 10 years on us in age mm. and they are going to, they're going to do it. And there's no reason why guys of our age, and this is a physical, it's a physical thing, you know? Mm. Uh, I think um, the saddest thing is that the musicians from this country, um, Matt Langer, Shania Twain, Def Leppard, I can go on, Foreigner, I mean, the, you guys don't know what the group of musicians and when apartheid fell, fell away, suddenly they took up uh, like in a classroom and they wiped, erased all these fantastic names. Um, and we had top class people in the world. Well, it was a double-edged sword because some of them like, uh, you look like a Charlize Theron. I mean, she's an Afrikaans girl from Benoni. 
Yeah. Um, she completely, in a way, well, lately, but um, these people that went over, they disconnected mm -hmm. themselves with South Africa because of apartheid, you know? <gasps> I mean, when I toured with Peter, I had to have my British passport. I could not have a South African passport. Mm. So I'm saying what we lost in terms of, of, of talent that went abroad, you got a guy like Trevor Rabin, 50 motion pictures. You mm. got a guy like Matt Langer. You got a guy like Duncan Foro. Mm. I'm saying I can continue to give you more. There's another guy, um, blinded by the light, Manfred Mann. All your fantastic, and then, you know, they make a fuss of guys. I'm not saying he's not talented. Hugh Masakela, this one. It's only black people. I don't know if there's a conscious. Um, a Johnny Clegg, I think Johnny Clegg's great, you know. But I'm just saying, there's either got to be an African connection here, where you cross over black and white. But I'm saying, honestly, besides the talent that was lost to Canada, um, it was lost to um, Australia, you also, you also lost doctors, lawyers. So I'm, I'm just telling you, you lost tremendous brain power and talent from this country. Yeah. It's it's true. So let's let's talk a bit about the plans for the tour now. Um, we're talking late 2022, September, somewhere around there. How long how, how long do you guys take to prepare for that as, as a band? When, 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 when we touched down from London and LA um, and we, we, we rehearse, it's going to be two months of solid rehearsing. I'd say in the, in the region of six hours a day, because, I mean, we'll, we'll play together instantly, probably within yeah. two days, we'll be like we were, but we've got a show to produce uh, and it's, it's gonna be a major production. We've got, we, we, we've got added musicians coming on to, to back, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we haven't got Trevor at the moment, so, We've got to get keyboards. We've got to get uh, other backing singers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to be a production. And Cliff, I didn't tell you yet that if we need an orchestra, we're getting one. And that's it. So, yeah. So I'm just saying if we need it, we're going to have it. Uh, there's going to be nothing about this show that is, that is not 100% superb. And it's going to be some incredible nostalgia as well, because that's what our audience want. And we're going to you give guys, it to them. You guys are going to be touring the, the Rock Rabbit album. Yeah, that seems like what we've got in mind for now. Yeah. And we, we will, we, among other stuff, but uh, we're going to re-release Rock Rabbit. And obviously, we'll work on other material. Mm. So, so as, as things stand right now, Rock Rabbit is busy being digitized as we speak. Um, um, the plan is the guys will arrive in August. Um, they're going to be spending August, October getting their act together, uh, practicing, getting on each other's nerves. Um, sort of around about, <laughs> around about uh, a September time, uh, um, we hope to put them into uh, the virtual productions studio. So virtual productions are, are the company. It's, it is a, there's a group of company called Virtual Collective um, that are sitting behind the South African leg of this tour, um, along with a company called Blue Banana Events, um, which is kind of sister to, to what I do here at Somerset, uh, Somerset Events. So around about September, we'll hopefully the guys are writing new new material as we speak. Um, the guys will be putting together a new new rabbit album, um, the three of them. Um, and then with the launch of that album, we'll launch the tour. So we, we're looking sort of around about sort of November-ish that we will start the tour. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just play it by ear and see how it goes from there. Are you guys going to visit all the centers in the country? Because um, in South Africa, in South Africa, they've literally just gone to Johannesburg and Cape Town in recent years and left 
Durban, Port Elizabeth, the, the plan there is to do the big centers, the, 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 the bigger shows. Um, there are <coughs> other, there is another well-known South African band, I'm not at liberty to say yet, um, that will be joining, will be joining the guys on stage. Um, they'll either be opening, playing with, or closing uh, uh, for Rabbit. Um, once um, we have those details and, 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 you know, we'll release that, but we'll be touring the major centers like that. And then we will take Rabbit old school style tour bus and then go around and visit all of the centers. Brilliant. Remember Brilliant. that bus tour, yeah. Neil. <laughs> Neil, remember <laughs> that bus tour. <laughs> uh, do say, do say, you've opened up a can of worms now. <laughs> that bus tour, unbelievable. We had the most incredible bus. I mean, it was fully decked out, bedrooms, bar, bathroom, I mean, everything. I mean, it was unbelievable. That was quite a bus. Are you guys, are you guys excited to get back on stage as rabbits? Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely, yeah. It's just, I mean, it's part of our lives, it's part of our DNA. I think we've all, we were all influences on each other musically because I think everybody in the band was, uh, I mean, that was the thing about rabbit. We were all, you know, we like to play. We were really cool musicians, and I learned off each one of them. I learned things from Ronnie and Neil, and they learned from me, and I learned from Trevor. And you know, believe it or not, Trevor even learned from us. We all have a certain um, uh, kind of feel that I think stayed with us. I think the Rollers picked it up. Our first Bay City Roller album had a lot of Rabbit influences. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely. Of course, we are. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. Um, just in closing, can people expect vintage rabbit with a twist or is it going to be just vintage rabbit with a twist yeah definitely definitely without doubts we 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 definitely going to do vintage rabbit all of those songs well not all maybe but mm. uh, and probably a lot of the songs that we didn't do do on stage before and uh, there's other stuff we've got to do because, um, you know, one exp we want to exploit our musicianship as well. So I've got some great ideas for instrumentals when I get together with the three, when the three of us get together, which I shall present to Neil very soon, as soon as we get together. And, um, you know, I've got some good uh, bass riffs, which I think were just designed to work with Neil great. And uh, we're going to work from there. Yeah, so absolutely. This is going to be mind-blowing, I'm telling you now. Well, I can tell you this much. Myself, for one, am very excited for this tour next year. And I've spoken to a couple of people in the last few days as well. Um, and everybody has said the same thing. They cannot wait to see Rabbit Live again. Well, well to, to, to give you an idea, I, I put out sort of tentative announcements, um, various social media channels, and my company inbox has a capacity of 10,000 mails, roughly. Um, mm -hmm. I've cleared it out three times. It's just insane. Brilliant. <laughs> it's insane. Brilliant. All right. Well, well, gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. So good to, to see, see you guys in person again. And I'm really personally super excited to see you guys on stage next year again. And, and Noel, please just tell everybody that the ugly rabbit, Ronnie Robot, is now the best looking. Okay? <laughs> I'll leave that to you. <laughs> gentlemen, best of luck with everything going forward. And we look forward to seeing rabbit in lights again. It was absolutely incredible to catch up. And obviously, there's a lot that you didn't see in the interview because there was quite a bit of banter before and after the interview as well. And a very enjoyable bunch of guys. And I'm pretty sure that next year, when they take to the stage again, it is going to be exactly as promised, electrifying and exciting and vintage with a twist. So very excited to have been involved in such an early stage and uh, I really look forward to being involved going forward. Um, that's where we're going to leave the show for today. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. with Tuesday Trends. Um, it's going to be 
a very informative show tomorrow <laughs> so you don't want to miss that be cool be safe remember what i always say if it bugs you you've got to deal with it baby i'll see you tomorrow at 10. Combine Investments, an impact venture capital company that turns entrepreneurs' dreams into reality. A core focus is to invest in high growth opportunities to maximize returns for shareholders, at the same time also providing a comprehensive service offering to cover all business needs. From small startups to larger companies, Kaban offers the entire spectrum of service offerings required to get business moving. Visit www.kaban.co.za for more information. Kaban Investments, turning entrepreneurs' dreams into reality. You're listening to RTLSA. I want to be on lockdown with Noel Johnson. You are listening to. You listening to. You're listening to. You're listening to Noel Johnson. Noel Johnson. Noel Johnson. And you're listening to Noel Johnson. And you're gonna party it up listening to Noel Johnson. As I was saying, you're listening to my mate, Noel Johnson. Party.